All right, right. we are live. Okay, okay, cool. Hello, friends. Thanks for your patience and waiting for us. We had a little bit of some technical difficulties, but we're all here now and very happy. Jessica, thank you for your patience and thank you for being here. Um, so welcome to Mess in Process. This is a conversation and workshop series that hosts artists, poets, and performers to discuss the messiness of creative process and the winding path that we take in our exploration of new ideas before they manifest as specific projects. Moving away from solely focusing on polished, completed work, we turn our attention towards the collaborative brainstorming, active research, and study-driven play that precedes the final pieces. I am Amber Rose Johnson. I'm the curator of this series. I'm a PhD candidate at Penn. Um, and I'll just say a word about how this program is going to run. We're expecting to go about an hour, give or take. We started a little late, so we'll see how it flows. Um, I'm going to give a short introduction of Jessica, um, who will then share some thoughts or musing on her creative process, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Um, to the right of the YouTube feed is a chat, and there are some active Kelly Writers House staff members, to whom I'm very grateful, who will be watching that chat and bringing your questions and comments forward for us to discuss. So we would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or want to just contribute anything to our conversation at any point, please drop that in there so that we can interact with y'all. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read this little intro and then Jessica, I'll pass it off to you. Sounds good. In an interview published by Bomb Magazine earlier this year, Jessica Vaughn remarked that her sensitivity to overlooked or ignored details of her surroundings allows her to, to quote, treat these spaces with consideration for the mundane and to deeply question how things, institutions, materials, and people work with, against, and alongside each other. Over the course of her art-making career, Jessica has worked with a range of materials and forms, both made and found, to carefully and critically interrogate how shared everyday materials and structures carry us, siphon us, regulate us, discipline us, according to the demands of capitalism in the age of global mass production. Her studio practice, which we'll be talking more about today, is deeply rooted in research and collection, and her multidisciplinary approach encompasses working with discarded materials to create artworks and installations that convey complex histories of place, production, and use. Her upcoming show at the ICA uh, opening in February, curated by Meg Only, presents new and recent works that mine the history of late 20th and 21st century work in office culture, social policies, labor practices created in the name of increased efficiency at the expense of visibility of Black workers and workers of color. The materials used inclu included in the show range from employee training materials, government reports, workplace lighting fixtures, with which she composes painting, video, sculpture, and photographs. Jessica Vaughn is a current Futures Fellow at the Clark Art Institute. She received a BHA from Carnegie Mellon University and an MFA from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a recipient of the 2019 Graham Foundation Grant and a 2017 Artadia Grant. And Vaughn has exhibited at the Kitchen, Sculptural Center, Studio Museum in Harlem, Akron Museum of Art, and more, both nationally and internationally. So Jessica, thank you again for being here. And I'm excited to hear your musings, your thoughts, your <laughs> offerings, your curiosities around your creative practice. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for having me, Amber Rose. Um, I'm really excited to do this conversation, talk a little bit more about the process and, and the practice in general. Um, thank you to uh, Kelly's, or Kelly, Kelly's Writer's House and um, also Penn and the MFA program at Penn. Um, and I would just like to also acknowledge um, the recent passing of um, Matt Friedman, who was a beloved uh, faculty member in the Department of Sculpture in the Fine Arts Program, who I worked with um, as an MFA student. 
Um, but I guess before I get to talking about um, Philadelphia, I'll just give a little background on myself, a little bit um, extensive from your introduction. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, I bring that up just because I think that a lot of my work has to do a lot or center around not just production and use, but also place um, and specifically urban centers. Um, seen as though somehow I ended up going to school and living most of my adult life in city centers. I think it's really sort of impacted how I think through my art practice. Um, so I spent a lot of time out there, obviously. Um, moved back to Chicago after spending some time in Pittsburgh, where I did my undergraduate degree in both visual arts and uh, social history at the time. Um, and then made my way to Philadelphia where I received my MFA in 2011. And that was a great experience. Spent about three years out in Philadelphia. And then now I reside in Brooklyn where I've been since 2012 now. It seems like forever. What a time. I know, I know, right? Um, and now I find myself in a place that is not urban, but I am in uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts until mm -hmm. the end of the year. Uh, doing a fellowship through the Clark Art Institute, um, basically having this amazing opportunity to research and really focus on my practice right now. So this is a great. Yeah, I, I am actually curious about how, what a research practice outside of an urban space in like a totally green lush big quiet space like how that informs because you are thinking so much about place how that informs just the way that you're able to do what you do how you attend to questions what the practice looks like outside of the making but just like the living practice yeah that's a really good point well i mean definitely being able to do this right now um during the pandemic in 2020 it's been a really a great source of just uh restarting and really thinking differently about things on a practical level, personal level, studio level, you know, it's, it's great to be in a place where I can just relax, you know, being in New York City, um, particularly earlier this year, and even, you know, knowing that I will be going back and everything's going on, like, yes, this is definitely affecting everyone everywhere. There are no boundaries, but um, the sense of like, you know, extreme sort of circumstances that was New York City um, earlier this year. It, it's great to have this as a resource right now. So, um, so the slowness is a really good thing for me right mm -hmm. now. Um, slowness in that, you know, the things around me are slow, I can take them in. And in a very strange way, that is how my practice sort of operates in general. It's like the slowness of looking at material the slowness of looking at space. So in that way, um, being out here is, is sort of in line with how I think through material and think through uh, or, or, or live with the practice, I guess. Um, also too, uh, you know, having resources where I can be directly confined to reading and like writing Mm -hmm. feeling this like crazy pressure to be in the studio even though that like kind of never goes away but like being like okay this is the space like I can't get out of being out of this space so um that's been like really good for me to, to know that I have a dedicated space to do this type of work because it's very difficult at least for me not necessarily being affiliated with a university um full time um I'm able to have this resource that I, I usually have to like, you know, fend for or fight for time or resource wise or both um, to be able to like, you know, take out 30 books or something like that. So right. it's been good. I want to, I want to ask questions about the things that you just said, but I also want to yield and make room for you to like make this, you know, if there's anything else that you want to say or put on the table before we really get into a back and forth. Yeah. Um, I would have to say that you know, just in general, like it's just been so far a really great experience having this sort of new environment to be in. Um, I am working on exhibitions as, as you know, for 2021 and one being at the ICA. So yes, you never get out of the studio, but 
um, <laughs> or those questions, but um, this is a good pace. Yeah. So maybe a place to begin is really just by asking you sort of what draws you to thinking about labor and infrastructure. I know that you've talked a little bit about that being some of your personal history. Yeah. Um, and so maybe you can say a little bit about that, but why that has become sort of a central focus in your practice. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think there's a couple things. I think one is that most artists, I would say, are looking at things like with like an intensity that like maybe most people overlook or, or, or don't have for the mundane, for the everyday, or for just things that are of interest to them. And for me, I think when I think when I have started to introduce this idea of uh, infrastructure or place for that matter and architecture into my work, I think that those three things really emphasize difference in a very particular way. Like architecture in one location is gonna look entirely different than another. Infrastructure for that matter is gonna be laid out in one part of the city in a very particular way than it does in, you know, five miles away. Right. And so I think that that particular difference that can be seen and can be seen by everyone, even if they are not paying attention, um, struck a very, um, decisive chord into sort of how I was thinking about material. And that's the other thing too, material is just made so, again, also visible, like you can see it um, and you can't really ignore it. And so I think on one level, it helped me to bring all these different ideas that I had together within a structure, within a form, within an object that like made sense. Um, and so I didn't have to like, Think through all these different modes of representation because it was there. It's embedded in that material because it brings together all of these different questions about capitalism, about space, about, you know, people in general, you know, that um, other modes of working or other material just not so much for me. Didn't do the same thing. And then um, I think, secondly, too, like this question of like work and labor, yes, it's universal, but as much as I think through like my own like personal sort of like way of life or upbringing for that matter, like it's always been sort of like this central question, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's something that, you know, we all do, but at the same time, I, I think a lot about my family and like the conversations that we would have or like sort of how we sort of recognized each other in a way, mm -hmm. as odd as that sound um, sounds, excuse me, is sort of through questions of, of thinking about our relationship to work and like, what does that sort of mean? And how does that change over time? It's something that like, you can see a difference in and, and, and sort of recognize. And I don't know, it was just, it's something that like really stuck for me. And again, I could there's something that is very much material driven in that, like your body changes in, in terms of where you are doing or making the work, like how you cognitively think about things. Like there's all these different layers in which like work itself as, as just a thing is of, is of interest. Yeah. I mean, I, I am always sort of unsettled maybe a little bit that one of the first questions when you meet someone or are introducing someone is like, what do you do? What yeah. is that you do? Um, I, you know, recently introduced a friend to my, my parents and the first question was like, so how do you, you know, what work are you doing? Um, and even the way we write kind of our bios or talk about who we are, or what we do, it's very much labor first. Yeah. Um, but something that I appreciate about your practice is, is this focus on the mundane and is focus on labor that is often sort of ignored, um, not celebrated work that is kind of the, um, the structure of the other kinds of work that is respected or seen as important. Um, and I think that question of, you know, what is important work is a question that's really, that folks are really engaging with around the pandemic and this idea of essential workers and realizing who is actually essential and who is not, who is doing the work that, that allows us to continue and who isn't. Are you, is there any way in which sort of the way that the labor conversation has shifted on a national scale, has that, um, is that something that you sort of anticipated or that you felt like 
your work was maybe already engaged in those questions before they came up? Have those questions changed the way that you think about your practice currently? Yeah, um, those are definitely questions that I was engaged with um, prior to sort of this shit show since 2020. <laughs> but um, at the same time, though, too, I, I, I think it definitely has sort of re invigorated a way in which I'm starting to like think through work and and uh, as like th I shouldn't say think through but how that is sort of like an overarching concept within the work or or a question I should say more so not concept but like question that I circulate around when when making a piece um, yeah I think it's I think the work has shifted a bit in trying to think through how the body is sort of being occupied in various ways when you're invested in work, if that sort of makes any sense. Like thinking through not just the physical, but also the cognitive, also the emotional, like all those, thi all those things happen like simultaneously through working. And so when you have all these other outside or external pressures, like, how does the work start to change and like look different? And so thinking through it as more of a process and sort of an end result of like labor and what that is, is I think more important to the practice. And I think I was getting to that sort of understanding, right? Is because I feel like oftentimes within artworks, you're seeing a very particular representation of work and you're seeing the end result of work rather than you know, what is happening through all these processes of change over time when something is being produced. And um, I think partly that was my interest in text and something written and something on paper mm. um, in some of the work versus as much as being object making or the works that you see where um, it's like uh, upholstery cut out in different shapes. Like that's really like suggesting or nodding towards like the process of things rather than sort of the end results. Right. And also too, I was interested in, as you see in the, in the newer works is thinking through, well, what does this question of representation, if it's happening within art making in terms of labor and people of color and, and specifically black workers, it's oftentimes rele relegated to thinking through production on the assembly line and thinking through production through manual labor. And we never think about these spaces as often that relate to either white collar work or office work mm -hmm. where in, you know, before this, and I would say even after, you're still gonna see plenty of people of color in middle management or not management, but working in those spaces. And so what does that look like? What does that feel like? How does it sort of manifest itself? And I think it's oftentimes not talked about and trying to find out how it's talked about or what it feels like and what it looks like outside of personal experiences was sort of a challenge and something that I was interested in figuring out, like, what is that process? What is that? What's that residual stuff that's being left out? So I'm gonna share the PowerPoint right now. Um, and yeah, okay, bring up, um, bring up some of the work so we can talk a little more concretely about them. Um, when you were saying that you were interested in working with text, I immediately thought about, you know, these video stills, and these are from um, our primary, our primary focus is to be successful, which is a two channel video. Um, and what you're seeing right now is grabs uh, from the two channels kind of juxtaposed together. And I wonder if you might say something about your process of making this work in particular, um, how you went about sort of compiling it and what this text is that's on the second blue channel. Um, I was curious if that was something that you just wrote um, or if that was also found material that you brought in. And maybe if you can say something about thinking juxtapositionally, to use Christina Sharp's phrase, um, or like thinking across these two mediums and, and what that makes for you? Yeah, um, those are all good questions. Um, 
So I have like work experiences in, in some of the spaces that I was just referring to, specifically office spaces, some essential service work, but mostly office spaces as it's represented in these videos. And, you know, at the time when I started this project around like 2018 or so, I was in those spaces and feeling sort of like a shift in how I was just like sort of acclimating myself to them. And like, that came from just being very hyper focused on the space itself, the type of work that I was doing. Um, and all those things were like sort of coming together in a very concrete way where I was like a lot of what I'm sort of this uh, hesitation I'm feeling about this work and these spaces is coming really from the language in which, you know, that is being used in these spaces and the hesitancy that, um, you know, fellow coworkers might have for how they interact with people who may not be of their same demographic, et cetera. So it just sort of uh, fueled my interest in wanting to research the crap out of like anything and everything I could find in relationship to um, diversity in workplaces as a program as something that is administered by like an HR department or consulting firm, places like that. And how is it law? Like how is diversity different than like law, say like affirmative action? Like how are those programs different? How does the language shift? So language and text really became the uh, material because that was the material that you could find. Like it's 2020, no, I mean, 2018 to 20, like, yes, we have a new president, crazy things are actually physically put out in the world that become a thing that look um, egregious. But a lot of that too is, is seen within text itself. So that became the material that I started to work with. And um, through all this sort of research of seeing the difference between like affirmative action becoming these sort of um, obscure sort of diversity policies that would as well exist in the workforce alongside affirmative action that oftentimes was never completely um, used as such. Um, I started to figure out like the lineage and history of like how this came to be in an American context. And so like the late 80s, 90s is when you see a lot of consulting videos and being made and also consultants going out there into the world as such as these promoters of like, hey, you can adopt this program into your culture. And this becomes and this becomes such because of lawsuits and, and litigation that were brought up towards companies because of their inability to um, adhere to affirmative action or discrimination um, or anti-discrimination policies. Um, so I just started to culminate a bunch of these VHS videos from the 80s, 90s that were some of the first alongside newer videos that I was finding online started to make these montages, these different screenshots. The text that you see on the right are, is transcribed text from many of these videos. And so that transcribed text I put alongside this sort of hodgepodge of video. There are some spaces like this one where I did uh, shoot video on site at different office places. This happens to be Amsterdam News in uh, Harlem. And so they were very generous to let me go in there and just film the different like areas of their workplace. And it's sort of like a hodgepodge. And I'd been in there a couple of times. I don't know if any of you have been, but it's a brown, like a three-story brownstone that used to be a I think, painting manufacturer at some point, like way back in the day, like before they even took it over, which I believe was in the 40s, if I'm right. Um, but it's this hodgepodge of a space and so with a storefront on the on the first floor on 125th and like I'd been in there before and I was just always taken by just piles and piles of newspaper like everywhere. Yeah. yeah so like physically materially I was like this is insane like you're never going to see this any place and so you know fast forward three four years later I was like I'm going to try to see if I can like shoot in there so last year they were willing to let me in there. I don't know why or how, but they let me go in there. And so I just started to um, shoot on different floors. And so, so, so I've incorporated some of the footage from that um, into there. And um, yeah, there was also this, this sense of 
filming in there where I was like, okay, this is one of the few black owned businesses that have been around for like ever. Um, and there was something about like knowledge production and like information being housed in a place um, with that much history and specifically by black workers that I somehow I wanted to engage with. And it's not so much centrally to the video that that's important, but again, like when I'm thinking through like what I want to do um, and like in terms of like what materials do I want to work with or how do I want to engage in the studio practice, like these sort of very particular questions come up in terms of thinking about place and site and location. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move through to these photos, um, which are two very different process photos um, yeah. for two works. Um, the first one, South Beach Blue, I believe, well, maybe you can say something about it, but I believe that this was a collection of works that was actually made for a show at a gallery in New York in 2017, um, but maybe they're being reoriented for something in 2021? Yeah, so, yeah, so to your point, yes, these are all process of things in current mode or production. And um, the image on the left um, was shown, that's a gallery shot uh, from a show I had at Martos Gallery in 2017. And these are cutouts of upholstery, manner, uh, of upholstery that is typically used for trains and buses. And so all the negative die cuts that you see is what actually goes on the bus. And what you see on the floor is everything else that they kind of throw away. And so between like 15, 16, I was like collecting all this stuff, um, didn't really know what to do with it. And then I just started to make these pieces. And so what you see on the left um, is actually backed with plexi and much manageable size in terms of it being four by five. But these actually come out on like a huge like conveyor belt when they're doing the die cutting. So they're much longer. Mm. So uh, a lot of the larger shapes uh, a lot of the larger die cuts will be shown at the ICA just as material, not um, connected to any sort of plexi substrate. So that's a smaller version, but an idea of like what you will see. And then on your right is a new work that I am um, currently producing. And those are small little foam shapes um, that are little tiny mock-ups of what will be much bigger. <laughs> it's called Hope Labor Flat and Folded. 2020. And so I'm making these larger um, shapes out of aluminum that will be that similar color and they will be folded and will exist flat on the floor. They're like six by five feet. They're very large. Um, but all of those shapes are based off of training um, tutorials that um, I actually found online through government's website. So the government doesn't necessarily have to use them, but they do produce them and other businesses or companies can use them to help with um, training their workers. Basically workers trying to figure out, so it'd be more like training centers or certain college sort of situations where you're trying to figure out like, what do I want to do? And so um, there's these sort of employment training guides and part of those guides and one of them have these shapes where you can mold them into different forms, pretty much to figure out your spatial relationship to material. So you're just, doing that over time. Anyway, so I was really interested in those shapes. Again, mining material, like really figuring out the, phys the physicalness of like, what is this text? What is all this stuff on paper? And so, you know, I'm making them into these larger sculptures out of aluminum. And the aluminum felt like really important because that's really used in a lot of like trade work and, um, so I was interested in making these shapes. How, how would you say that your process of thinking about, I mean, these are two very different kinds of sculptural work. Um, it sounds like for the first one, you were going out and finding, I don't even know how you find these, how do you find these discarded materials? Are you going but that's to the, the thing. authority it's and being like, hey, can I get your scraps or? But yeah, like that's the thing where like the research comes in. It's just like figuring out like who's making this material and like how these things are actually made. So it really started off with, okay, 
I know the Chicago Transit Authority because I grew up going to school, taking the subway, all of that, right? So like I have a affinity for the history and the material. So that's why I was like, oh, I need to get it from Chicago because I know they have fabric on their seats. They do in Philly too, but Philly wasn't open to me coming and getting anything okay. <laughs> at the time. Okay. But, no. but like, you know, New York City, like it's a shit show. No one's going to talk to you, but also too, it's all fiberglass. So right. I like had that experience. I knew I was like, okay, how does the system there work? And then, okay, is there possibly any sort of link that I could make that could be easily attainable to get that material? And so then it's like a back and forth between like calling places, see who wants to work with you to figuring out the language and the history of that material. And that also, also, that also helps for people to like want to work with you when you come with like knowledge and you're like, okay, like, you know, could you, can we negotiate something? Can we make something happen? And so basically, you know, the seats come from like the train yard. And then I figured out like who was actually adhering the material to the seats. And that was somebody on the west side of the city. So I just reached out to them. They're like, yeah, we're not doing it. I don't, th I don't think that would happen now. But at the time, it was like, yeah, we're not doing anything with it. You can come take it. So... Yeah, it's all this like back and forth of like negotiating the, the material and the moment that's like sort of makes sense with what it is that you're doing. And just having some hope that like this is actually going to like work itself out because I didn't know what I was going to get. So I was like, you may not have anything in the gallery space. Critical hope as a part <laughs> of the process. Yes, it's, it's a lot of uh, crossing your fingers, but yeah. So that leads me perfectly. I wanted to sort of pivot to, to talking a little bit more about the sort of personal aspects of your studio practice. Um, maybe a question to begin with is just how do you maintain or attend to your studio space? How do you make it a space that's conducive to creative practice? Um, yeah, how do you make it feel like a place where you can stretch and explore? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, especially in New York where space is a premium and <laughs> my studio is definitely small. Um, I have the tendency to, I think in the last year and a half and particularly this year, reading has become like very, um, helpful for my practice. It's helped me to slow down. It's helped me to make space for myself that has been like super important and that helps me to also organize ideas because I have this tendency to just like everything is like related to one another and so like the books really help for me to simmer it down and just like grab what I need but not have to grab physical material it just before I need to get the physical material because I'll read something I'll be like oh that makes more sense and so that will simmer down over here elevate this over here <laughs> and at some point it comes like this yeah um so that has been super helpful and also working with things that are like immediately like near me you know because like these last few years i've had this like um luxury of being able to be like okay i'm gonna work with stuff from physically from here in dallas to stuff here in chicago like material wise and like that's not happening right now. And so it always comes back to these, um, the ideas that I have floating around in my head that um, help to, you know, settle down that like anything can actually be made and it doesn't matter what you're using or the time frame that you have, it will get done because it's about putting those ideas into the world or putting that discussion into the world. Um, as being the most sort of important thing for me. So I, I think this sort of back and forth between the reading, particularly this year, and then also bouncing ideas and and just having conversation with other artists helps to sort of solidify my studio space, the physical space for me. Do you ever, has there ever been an idea or you know something that you wanted to put out into the world that you tried in one medium and then realized, oh, that's not the right medium. I, this is not a sculpture, it's a video. Or like, this isn't a video, yeah. it's a painting. 
Can you talk a little bit about that sort of discovery or back and forth moving around through different mediums until you land on, oh, this is the form that really fits this idea? All the time, Amber Rose, <laughs> all the time. Stuff always doesn't work out. But um, I would have to say with probably, like I, I, I definitely feel like, oh, there was something that like really came out of the lucky sort of feeling you get sometimes when the first thing happens and that's like the right thing. And I think maybe with some of the recent work, uh, that was the case. Um, but I would say like this book project has really been sort of like an aha moment for me in terms of like thinking through ma material a little bit more and like books are an object. Mm -hmm. But there's just so much 2D thinking that happens in it as well, which I haven't really been invested with um, as much lately. But the book has really brought me back to sort of like a 2D language in a way that I think feels good. And so I really want to explore. But um, that sort of pivoting between material, it almost feels like and and. Uh, yeah, material and and just sort of visual language for me um, always feels somewhat natural. And so I just go with it. And I do feel that like uh, with the studio practice for me, I'm always like, yeah, sometimes this doesn't make sense as a, as a drawing, you know, maybe this makes more sense as a sculpture or a collage. So I just kind of go with it. I don't, um, I don't rest too much on, on getting caught up in the form. Maybe more back in the day, like in grad school and stuff, I'd be like, oh my God, it needs to be this. But now I'm just like, whatever, like this is going to yeah. be a photograph and like that's what it is and like on to the next. Um, yeah. So, Do you find that it's that it's almost immediately sort of on to the next or are there works that you, are there any particular works that you're sort of endlessly wrestling with or kind of always processing? Yeah. I mean, if I want to put myself out there, I would definitely say the stuff I've been making in the last year or so, it's just like, um, I recently had a show last year where uh, I think it can work and it does work as a, as an installation, the one that I had in Dallas. Like I, I do think it works as an installation, but there is something about doing this book um, project that will hopefully be done by the end of the year that um, it feels very right. There's something about it that feels like it, it's really, uh, singing as a book that I'm, I'm excited to share with other people. So, yeah. And then there's the video project too. Um, our primary goal is to be successful. Like, I was like, what the hell am I going to do with all this text I'm finding? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not somebody who just sits there and like presents all this text in an exhibition space. And then I was just like, there has to be some like physical form or material that exists in the world outside of that. And then the video came, I was like, okay, the vid, like it just has to be that because that's the thing that, you know? Yeah. So I just kind of let like the searching and the, and the, you know, moving around, just, I let that drive like what the thing is going to be. Yeah. So I just want to say the book that you're referring to is Depreciating Assets forthcoming from printed matter mm -hmm. so you know pre-order or like whatever <laughs> look for that book a little plug for you there um as we get towards the end of this conversation i wonder jessica if we can talk a little bit about when you take off your art maker hat um or when your art making energies are running low where do you go um do you have any like tried and true touchstones that might be books, places, foods, takeout orders that fuel you and like are just to sort of restore and recalibrate? Mm, I'm an active person so I like to you know run and do things like that which I always find to be very um it's just great all around for me. Um, definitely checking in with friends and staying in contact with them is of super importance in family. Um, but I will, since I'm going to put myself out there, also put out there a couple other people who went to Penn, Iggy and Charlotte. Um, 
in regards to television because <laughs> let's be that, honest let's be that, honest yes me. that is a that's a huge sort of saving grace for me right now particularly in the time of being you know by yourself and you know or in the woods so um real housewives have, has been a very <laughs> It's been a saving grace for me. I love that. Uh, I've also really gotten into uh, great, what, what is it, British Bake Off? Oh, the Great British Bake Off, yes. 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 <laughs> That's been nice too. So, you know, it's all around. Like, I don't, every, you know, I'm, I'm really into anything that is out there in the world that can, like, help me decompress. Um, I'm definitely uh, actively always... Uh, interested in new things and you know so but those are a few of those things right now okay so you mentioned talking to friends was one of those things and i wanted to ask about how collaboration is something that feeds and fuels you um which i recognize is sort of difficult to talk about in a way because i mean because of the pandemic and everything going on and you're in this fellowship but you talked a little bit about where collaboration comes up from maybe sort of unlikely figures like whoever's answering the phone at yeah. the, you know, scrap, whatever. Yeah. Um, so can you say a little bit about, you know, how collaboration shows up and even in this time of isolation and kind of narrowing your focus on your research, where collaboration is still kind of popping its head up um, in your process currently? Yeah, I mean, I've been pretty lucky in the last few years that um, even if people haven't been like, physically near me. Um, I've been able to be in touch with them about just the practice. And I've been fortunate enough to do a few sort of like shared conversations and interviews um, that have been been that have been very helpful. And so, you know, the one you opened up with, with Charlotte's and I did one with Magdalene for art papers and working with Sadia on so just some of the people I've worked with recently. Um, all of that has been like really helpful in terms of sort of thinking through potentially like what collaboration could be in my practice. And um, they all have different sort of backgrounds when it comes to art making, but it's been um, super productive in that respect. And yeah, the collaboration too, like even like, thinking through like how are you getting work done like how is anyone getting work right done right now without working with others um when you don't have like like I don't have access to like a huge welding facility right you know um I so like how do I get that done well you know I have to work with others to sort of um to produce those you know like I and and that's the other thing too it's just like a lot of the work right now has to start from like sketches and designs and things you do on a computer um and sketch up or what have you but then you have to negotiate and work with others to like figure out the last piece because someone else is pulling that machine along or pulling along sort of those sort of aesthetics in a way that you guys are negotiating and talking through that so um yeah, there's, there's just different ways in which I've started to see collaboration as not having to be just like the end results as like, oh, we put this show up together. It's like, no, there's all this process behind it that is like the real collaboration portion for me. So. Mm -hmm. I want to selfishly um, yeah. share this um, screen grab that I have from a collaboration that you and I did mm -hmm. um, working on rewriting uh, the policy on equal opportunity and affirmative action at Penn. Oops, oops. Um, and what's up right now is literally our Google Doc <laughs> from over the summer um, where we were taking the original policy and doing that rewriting. And one of the reasons why I was so excited to work with you on this project um, is because it's sort of stepping outside of the exhibition space and is trying to make a, a, an impact that will have like material, you know, reality, material consequences mm -hmm. um, for the Penn community. So I wonder if you might say something about 
sort of the full circle moment of you returning to the institution where you did a lot of your own artistic process in the MFA program and now you're sort of engaging with it in a different kind of process um, through through the show but also through specifically this um, statement that we worked on. Um, yeah I mean I guess it was really again like coming back to thinking through okay there's all this like uh, work or labor that's like never accounted for, never materialized outside of the finished product. So I think with this sort of work, uh, I was really much interested in, in like showing that process, obviously, as you see on the screen. Um, but yeah, thinking about this space in a different way, like thinking through like what language and what sort of material well thinking about the language too but also like the material consequences of like when something isn't made clear or um activated in a way that accounts for everyone um which has been this year and so i think that you know i was already doing this work with the book project and like thinking about text and language as being like a material in and of itself and so this sort of i think really drove the interest in doing this work yeah. Um, cool. Thank you. So maybe um, I'll ask two more questions. And if anyone watching has any questions, um, we'd love to hear from you. So please drop them in the YouTube chat. Um, but maybe just in closing, it's so, I mean, one of the things that you said a few minutes ago was like how anyone is doing labor right now. And that wasn't the end of the sentence, but that could have been the end of the sentence. <laughs> Because what is labor right now? I mean, I'm, I think we're all, many of us are sort of asking that question as we're trying to continue to perform labor, perform showing up, perform yeah. meetings, these meetings and so on. And there is absolute, complete and utter chaos around us at every waking moment. Everyone that I talk to is like, yeah, I'm working, but I'm super anxious, but I'm super tired, okay. but I don't have time, but I can't engage, but I'm like, and yet we're still sort of doing this labor performance. Um, yeah. And not everyone has the real privilege of being able to slow, slow, slow down and sort of listen to themselves and focus on what they need. Um, so I wonder if you just have any thoughts about labor right at this moment and how we're all sort of collectively processing or not processing um are the the unique challenges that we're facing around labor right now yeah i mean i think um this moment and particularly thinking about like people that i know and family and those that i'm close to like i think it's really shifted you know our relationships to what it means to be not only employed but um like dealing with institutional structures and you know like the importance of them or lack of importance of them you know and i also think it's really made clear like you know the luxury that you can have to be able to work from a designated space versus having to go in every day and and do that type of thing i mean i and, and to and to work you know i I'm dreadful of having to, to go back into a physical space right now and to be in an office space again and, and do that type of stuff. So like my, my, even my reckoning with like, what does it mean to be in spaces and what does that architecture look like and, and what that holds for the future? I mean, you know, you can't control that, but like that sort of psychology of that and thinking through it is, is, sort of daunting, but in a, in a way also fuels, I think, for me at least, the type of work that I'm making and the expectations that we sort of have for one another. I, for sure, you know, sometimes we can make um, assumptions, but, you know, I for sure don't anymore about like the conditions in which people are working or what their bodies have capacity for. So, yeah, I think, I think in, in, in some sort of way, it's definitely opened up sort of um, 
what should be considered or what we do consider um, for others and how we treat each other in space. Yeah, that actually feels, I think, like a good place to end. Um, Jessica, thanks so much for talking yeah. to me a little bit about your process, your messiness. Mm -hmm. um, super excited for the show opening in February. Yes, thank you. I look forward. Yes, hopefully we'll see each other in person in Philadelphia for the install, but I know. You know, to, be, to be continued. We'll see. How right, TBD. Um, all right, thanks so much for joining us, Jessica, and thanks for watching, folks. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye.